webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website, autism.org. Before we get started, I'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Judy Vandewater is a professor of medicine at the University of California, Davis. Her research interests include clinical immunology and immunopathology with specific training and expertise in the gestational immune development. Her work encompasses both the cellular response and humoral immune response during pregnancy and how this relates to neurobehavioral disorders such as autism and schizophrenia. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Vandewater. Thanks so much, Denise. It's awesome to be here. And I just realized that we're going to talk about COVID today. And it took over my slide, too, when it got reformatted. So there's the UC Davis got taken over by COVID, much like the rest of us have been for the past year and a half. Um, but today is going to be a, a little bit different than my normal seminar, partly because of the timely, um, the timely sort of massive pandemic that we've all been dealing with that we see as a maternal potential for maternal immune activation. So I'm going to bring you up to date on where we are in our maternal immune activation or you know, sort of inflammation during gestation, uh, arm of our research proposals or projects. But also I'm going to bring in a little bit of what we're doing in the COVID-19 space and, and how we are addressing that in our research program here. And hopefully I've, I've left a lot of time so that we can answer some questions if you have questions. And I know one big question on everyone's mind is with the vaccines available is if I'm pregnant, should I get vaccinated? I'm just going to put it out there. That is probably the, the biggest question, you know, that we get asked. Um, so I'm going to, I'm happy to take questions. I love getting questions. So, um, and it doesn't matter what, you, what the question is, I'm, I'm happy to address it. So as best I can. So with that, I just also want to give credit to my friend and my colleague, Dr. Lisa Crowen. She's an epidemiologist at um, Kaiser Permanente in the Division of Research there. And we've worked together a very long time. Much of the work I'm presenting today is work that we have done in the past together and work that we're doing now and, and currently. And we're writing more projects to just to keep addressing this topic as best we can. So, you know, and I, I'd like to begin this part of the presentation with thinking about the health of your immune system during pregnancy and how that can change the way your child's brain develops. And I, this is a, a topic that's had a lot of press. There's a lot out there about infection and, and um, the presence of neurodevelopmental disorders and just a whole host of things that may be contributing to neuro, neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism. And I think you know, this is, this is one of the things that we're addressing. And so we think about what if we could predict which children would be affected by a neurodevelopmental disorder from this um, type of exposure. And, and so that really is the basis of, of much of our research program right now. <clears throat> but I'd like to start with sort of understanding the role of the maternal immune system. So how does a woman's response to infection or an exposure during pregnancy increase the risk for having a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder. And that encompasses schizophrenia, autism, developmental delay. There's a whole spectrum of disorders. It's not specific to any one disorder. So to get started, I'd like to just give a little bit of a primer, a little bit of background on cytokines and chemokines, the molecules that we associate with inflammation. And I think I've never, in my years as an immunologist had what I do so well understood because, because of this pandemic, it, the word inflammation and cytokines, chemo, all of that has been out there just in the, in the media continuously. But what cytokines and chemokines are, they're the master regulators of the immune response. So they're small molecules that one cell produces and that other cell has receptors for. And it's through that process that the target cell, the target of those cytokines, then it produces an effect that can be proliferation, that can be activation, 
Um, it could be down regulation of their activity. It completely depends on what the stimulus was and what the profile of the cytokines um, were that were produced. And chemokines are a cousin to cytokine. They're really chemotractants. That's how they got their name. Um, they are what tells their cells where to go. So cells have receptors for these specific molecules and it is like they're following a trail that they can sniff out and they follow that gradient to the site of infection. And that, that whole process is to get the cells into a place where you have infection or um, an immune event to get them in there so that they can be dealt with. So the, um, the next piece of this is just an example of what uh, cytokines and chemokines at the neuroimmune interface, and we use that word now a lot, neuroimmune, uh, because, it's that, because we now realize how much these two systems are talking to each other every day, not just during neurodevelopment, but just for the health and well-being of everyone uh, constantly. So we have three of our top contenders for the pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-1 beta, TNF-alpha, and IL-6. IL-6, there's been a lot, a lot of out in the, in the um, scientific literature about the role of this cytokine, um, in, in especially in autism and schizophrenia, but these are the pro-inflammatory pathways in the immune environment. These are your first responders in how how um, the when the immune system gets triggered by infection or exposure, these are the, these are what are called into play. In the CNS environment, they are also what goes along with that sleep fever response you feel when you're sick. That sort of through the um, hypothalamus, they are triggering the body that we have an infection. We need to slow down. We need to be able to heal. So this is. Um, this is what the um, sleep fever response, but in high, very high levels, especially IL-1 beta and to a lesser extent TNF-alpha contribute to neurotoxicity. So they, too much of a good thing will then actually cause neurons to, to have a, a toxic effect on neurons. But that said, there is what we call a Goldilocks effect even for what we think of as inflammatory cytokines in that, especially IL-6, too little is also bad during neurodevelopment. We need that sort of that sweet spot, right amount for healthy neurodevelopment. And then TGF-beta, which is a regulatory cytokine, is involved in, in, in the inflammatory pathway. This is the cytokine that when you've already, when you've got an immune response ongoing, the system sort of switches into a, um, an anti-inflammatory pathway. And this affects almost all aspects of neurodevelopment. So this, it, it, it's a growth factor. It's, it's keeping things in balance in the brain. So it's really important for that. And these are three, just an example of three uh, growth factor and, and chemokine CCL1. And I hate these new designations. I like the old ones. So I know what they do, <laughs> like macrophage chemotactic protein. Um, but these, these uh, chemokines are, as I said, involved in leukocyte trafficking, white blood cell trafficking, lymphocyte trafficking, um, neutrophil trafficking to the site of infection. But they're really important for also getting cells in the brain as they're migrating where they need to go. So they're involved in oligodendrite. So the oligodendrites that produce the myelin sheaths on nerves, inner neuron migration. So as the neurons are migrating between one section of the brain and another, and then modulating the immune response. Definitely, they would be involved in inflammation because as I said, they're calling cells into the site of infection, but they do have very important roles. And we're really trying to fully understand their roles now in, in um, the, the migration of cells in the brain as the brain develops. However, just like everything else, you need balance. So you don't want an immune system so suppressed that you are constantly fighting infections and not efficiently in fighting infections. At the same time, you want to be, um, you don't want hyper responsiveness because that can lead you then into autoimmune, an autoimmune disorder, right? So that lack of re regulation is what gets us to autoimmunity. So, but there are many, many factors in, in us, each of us, um, the genetic susceptibility to either under responding or over responding. 
um, sadly aging. As we age, our immune system becomes a little bit less efficient. Hormonal status may alter immune regulation. Um, you may be more prone during certain um, uh, hormonal fluctuations to, to um, getting a cold. Um, but this is why some people are resilient to the effects of infection during pregnancy and others are not. And I think I wanna be very clear that the, um, what we see in the literature, what we see in the lab, we don't get 100% of people who've gotten an infection during pregnancy going on to have a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder. So how, how does the immune system work in the CNS? Well, what we now know is how important the cells that are in outside the parenchyma of the brain in the subdural space are for brain health and memory. They do serve a function that if there's an infection, if they get uh, alarmed to infection, that they can go into the parenchymal space and try to cope with that infection. Thus, and also they're going to cause some damage along the way, just like it happens if you get the flu and you're coughing up stuff, you're coughing up all the cells that die, you know, that you that were killed in the process of both fighting the flu and that the flu took out, you know, the influenza virus took out itself. So, you know, this this part of the brain is definitely it, it's when when you've got an issue, you're cleaning up. But over here, if you remove there are certain T cells that if they were not present in that space and you don't get healthy sleep, this is another important aspect, you that your memory becomes severely impaired. And we've done this in, in animal studies. Uh, so there's an entire lymphatic system, oopsie, an entire lymphatic system in the brain that is dealing with clearing, cleaning, and immune surveillance. So the cells that are involved in, in the neuroimmune response, and there are several, it's the same players that we see in the periphery. Um, so here is the subarachnoid space, and they're in that, the dura mater, in that, this sort of space underneath your skull in the brain, as I said. So T cells that stimulate other cells, and they're producing inflammatory cytokines, they're producing regulatory cytokines. B cells that are producing um, antibodies, including autoantibodies, unfortunately. So antibodies to cell proteins, which I talked about in my first seminar. Macrophages are your first line of defense and they present foreign antigens to T cells. So these, so when a macrophage is there, it's surveilling for anything that shouldn't be there. And then it triggers the response that we see down and same with dendritic cells. They are a little bit more specialized. Um, we also have regulatory dendritic cells and, and activated dendritic cells. And the same with macrophages, right? So we've got, even within these cells, we have subtypes of cells. And neutrophils are your first line of defense with, um, in, ter in terms of the bacterial infection. Um, we don't see as their play as much in the normal, in the homeostasis of the brain. We really see those when you've actually got an active infection. Now down to the neuro specific cells, the astrocytes so are support cells. They do, they can produce and respond to cytokines, but you can see they, they're, they're supporting the, the um, vasculature. They've got these little, little doorways or little windows that let things in and out of, um, through the blood brain barrier, or they can help control the blood brain barrier. They also are supporting the vasculature. So this is a vessel in the, in the, that space and they are supporting the neurons. So these, these are kind of the workhorse in terms of everything that sort of support network um, of the brain, keeping everything connected and working. The microglia um, are the macrophages of the brain. I think that's the simplest way to think of them. There's a lot of controversy about whether they actually are macrophages, where they come from, but, but they are sort of, they are responsible. For, they have many, many functions, a very important cell in the brain. We hear a lot about microglial um, activation, inflammation, being related to autism or schizophrenia. And I think we're still trying to understand how that happens and, and the role for that. But um, the, um, these cells are, again, sampling the environment. They have the ability to produce cytokines. They respond to chemokines. They will ball up when they're activated and to do their job to get the immune response going, if that's what's needed. They help prune when cell, when these, um, they're pruning the um, developing, oh, sorry, the developing neurons as the brain is developing. That's a very important step. You have a ton of neurons that you make and they, they prune back to the ones that are um, functional and essential. 
Then oligodendrocytes, as I said, are support cells for neurons. They make the myelin. They make that myelin sheath that the signal jumps from myelin sheath to myelin to myelin along the neuron axis. And some of these, because neurons will extend from your brain down to your toes, right? So they, this communication system and the health of this is supported so that you have um, active transmission all the way down. And then neurons, as we know, are very important. <laughs> they are the communication network of the brain. So I wanted to talk about the maternal immune activation, which is what we think of when you, like infection during um, gestation. And um, one example of a real time, we're having a real time pandemic of maternal immune, potential maternal immune activation. I mean, this is, we will hopefully never have another opportunity like this, but this is a time where we have the ability to study this in real time and what's going on with a very um, uh, provocative infection, because this is an infection that does not go quietly for many people, right? This is an infection that really manifests a huge immune response. So this is sort of a, a um, this is kind of a, an example of the cytokines and growth factors and chemokines that, produ that promote the onset and progression of inflammatory manifestations, dysregulation of the immune system and a disease state due to the effect of these um, both modifiable and unmodifiable risk factors. So this is kind of when I was talking about balance, this is what I'm talking about. You need that healthy immune system. You need, and these are all the, the cytokines and chemokines and growth factors that help maintain that homeostasis. And then we, when we have an unbalanced or disease state, and this is pushed by a storm of inflammatory cytokines and growth factors that, you know, you can't control your age or your genetic makeup, but you can control all of the other um, unhealthy. And one of the most interesting things that we've noticed is obesity um, and um, metabolic syndrome, especially during pregnancy, is a risk factor for autism. It's a risk factor partly because of its inflammatory component of, related to it, but it's also a risk factor for the maternal autoantibodies that I spoke about in, in my first webinar. Then these, as I said, these are the inflammatory cytokines. When these are pushing on this system, you're going to get an unbalanced immune um, system and, and potential disease state. As I said, not everybody, if they get an infection, goes this route. Um, it, it all is depending on your genetic background and how well you control this balance of the system. So the infection and development model, so the MIA model, is, is really depicted by the, you've got induction. So you have the fever response, which is happening in the HPAS, the hippocampal, um, or the, I'm sorry, the um, hypothalamus in, in, um, in this axis here. So the inflammation comes in the mom, okay, She's going to fight the infection. That's that's important and necessary, but unfortunately, some of these cytokines will also get transferred into the fetal compartment. Now, remember, the fetus is making chemokines because they've got all this this um, uh, development of the brain going on. They're making growth factors. All of these things are being made, but there's definitely a delicate balance for how much of the inflammatory um, component comes into play here. And then we know that. If you just have overwhelming inflammation, it will change how the brain develops. So that in, infection requires for this maternal immune activation model to be, to come into play, it requires a fever. That fever response, remember I said TNF alpha, IL-1, IL-6, induce that response. That is necessary for the pathology that I'm talking about. So impaired immune regulation, the reduced ability to control this inflammation is then what potentially leads to <clears throat> an increase in inflammatory cytokine production and that imbalance that I showed earlier. So the interactions between the nervous system and immune system occur throughout the lifespan. This is something, as I said, this is going on constantly. The blood-brain barrier is not as impervi impervious as we used to think it was. Antibodies are still very large, very difficult to go across this barrier unless there's a breach in these, these little windows, fenestrations in the, in the blood-brain barrier, and if these little cells open up. But small molecules do get across. And the other important piece of this is that 
the neurons, in, in addition to making neurotransmitters, also can be activated to make cytokines, as can astroglia, as can microglia. The B cell, or so the immune cells, have cytokine receptors, but they also have receptors on them for neurotransmitters. And this was really only um, uh, recognized, I probably in the, I certainly in the time that I've been working in autism and in the last 10 years that we've really understood that this is bidirectional. It's not just immune components trashing, you know, the, the neurons. It's really truly a communication system that is ongoing and goes back and forth between the two. And immune, as I said, so immune signaling molecules play critical roles in all stages of fetal brain development. First of all, the immune cells are developing at the same time. So the immune system is starting to develop at, at this, the same time in the fetal, in the fetus as the brain is developing. Obviously we have earlier um, in the brain, but here beginning about 12 weeks of gestation, we're starting to see migration of immune stem cells and expansion of the progenitor cells or the cells that drive bone marrow production of those cells. And then up until birth, they're, they're colonizing. And then once birth happens, the immune system then can be activated based on exposure. Along this time, we've also got neural migration is happening at the same time. And a lot of this, uh, what these factors that are being produced are driving that. Apoptosis is important for that pruning of the neurons and the formation of synaptogenesis is occurring and then continues to occur postnatally. But these are all going on at the same time and are actually reliant upon each other to co-develop. So the maternal fetal immune environment and neurodevelopmental disorders, there's a great deal of press that has gone on, up, you know, sort of like maternal stress, autoimmune conditions related to neurodevelopmental disorders, in utero infection itself, serolo serologic evidence of um, influenza in the etiology of, of schizophrenia, and preventative strategies that vitamin use um, in decreases the risk. So depending on what exposure you've had. So as I said, the majority of women that are exposed to immune challenges during pregnancy give birth to neurotypical offspring. I cannot say this. This is so such an important concept. And I I was at a presentation um, in INSAR when we had it in um, in um, the Basque region in Spain, and I remember a Danish researcher who was very prominent in in the um, sort of maternal immune activation, the clinical side of things, and looking at this in humans stood up there and said, most pregnancies turn out just fine if there is an infection. It just it is we but what we are trying to understand with that small percentage that goes on to have a neurodevelopmental disorder is why. Trying to understand why so potentially we could mitigate that. As a, there's huge genetic everything, genetics under is the underpinnings for everything, right? It, especially the immune system, how it functions is highly genetically controlled. So genetic susceptibility and how you respond, gestational timing of the exposure, how intense that exposure is, or that response is, which again speaks back to the genetic susceptibility. And then any additional postnatal events. We don't fully understand how um, what happens postnatally may also influence, excuse me, this event. So this is something that, this is why we spend what well, the time we spend on trying to understand this. So I'm gonna talk about the, um, my study with Lisa Krohn and, um, and that we did with Kaiser Research. And this is the early markers for autism study or the EMA study. And the, role, the goal of this study was to investigate the early biologic markers of susceptibility and exposures from cri during critical periods of brain development. So we looked, we looked, sorry, we look during in the mom in the um, prenatal period. We look early um, it, um, postnatally to to understand. So we get the newborn blood spots, genetics. What are the genetic underpinnings? Um, and we've published several papers on all this work now. And then the environment. How does the environment play a role in this? How what is the role of the of environmental exposures on e, in each of these time points and postnatally? So this is a population-based case control study. And what that means is that we're matching 
with the case, number with the cases were matching for the controls. In the phase one, we did a very small number, 84 ASD, 50 developmental delay without autism, and then population controls. And population controls in this study means they've never sought services in the state of California for neurodevelopmental disorder. It does not mean that we have validated that they are um, neurotypical children. So that, that's a caveat of this study. It's both a weakness and a strength. The, the strength of it is we're dealing, we're, we're looking at this, how in, in this, the global population, how, how do these compare? Uh, the weakness is that we don't have any, um, we don't have a true um, assessment of, of the outcome of the children. But it was a prospective collection. So this was one of the biggest prospective studies where we got maternal samples during the second um, semester, or semester, God, I've been teaching, trimester, and newborn peripheral blood. So we can understand much, of, as I said, a lot of what is um, present in the newborn is, has been transferred from the mother, but we also, depending on when that sample was taken, can have exposures in the newborn. So for the environmental piece and the prenatal piece, we're looking at agranochlorines, we're looking at air pollution, PBDEs, which is a flame retardant, PFCs, we're, we're, we have a number of um, exposures that we looked at. We did a genome-wide um, SNP analysis and um, CNV analysis, both of the moms and the kids through the newborn blood spots. In my lab, we looked at the cytokines, chemokines, C-reactive protein, immunoglobulins, and autoantibodies that I, the autoantibodies I mentioned last time. The, we looked at outcome and we had some data on outcome. So we had some data uh, in terms of um, the behaviors, we, we intellectual disability, um, ASD obviously versus um, developmental delay versus the general population controls. So we looked at the developmental and we looked at medical in terms of um, in the maternal. So this, I'm going to show you some very complicated data, but I, I, I will make sure that we, I will walk through it because I want you to understand sort of the complexity of this, but also what we got from this study. So the mothers in this, the data I'm going to show you compared mothers of children with autism or ASD, you know, on the ASD spectrum with no intellectual disability. So their, their um, IQ is above 70. Autism with intellectual disability, developmental delay, without autism, and then the general population control. So that was our population. And this very complicated, so we did a series of cytokines and chemokines. And for example, this is, this uh, GMCSF is a growth factor. These are the inflammatory cytokines from the innate immune system. These are the TH1 or T cell cytokines that are inflammatory, the Th2, which include the regulatory, Th17, which is its own sort of inflammatory, but later um, in, in the sequelae cytokine. Um, and then we have the innate inflammatory chemokines um, that we tested. So what we found that mothers of children with autism and intellectual disability had elevated inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. And this was, in comparison to the general population controls. And this also separated them from every other group. So those with intellectual disability versus developmental delay, when you see red, that means they were, these, these are just the p-values of how significantly each of these individual ones were upregulated. Blue means they were lower than they should have been. And then um, it also, and this was, I think, for us, the most exciting piece of this study was that it separated autism with intellectual disability from autism without intellectual disability. So this gave us a way of potentially sub-phenotyping in this population with um, two different potential risk factors, I mean, potential risk factors for, for a subtype of that population which I think was very exciting for us. And this also suggests a lack of selective immune regulation in um, the women that had this, this, these elevated profiles. <clears throat> so that was an exciting study, but we need larger interdisciplinary pregnancy studies to address the importance of inflammation and altered neurodevelopment. And that is expanding beyond just autism. So enter the, our immune, um, 
and metabolic markers during pregnancy and child development or the impact study. And this is a study again that I um, developed with Lisa Cron and the aims of this study are to characterize the maternal immune and metabolic profiles. Remember I said that altered um, sort of metabolic syndrome is, is an inflammatory um, condition and to determine the specific longitudinal patterns associated with neurodevelopmental outcomes in the offspring. Now we've expanded beyond just autism for this study. We also have included cerebral palsy, developmental delay without autism, and, and then we have um, those that were um, typically developing. So we, we're, the goal is to identify maternal factors, including demographic, the maternal clinical sequelae, her genet the mom's genetic makeup that is associated with altered maternal immune or metabolic and or, I should have put, a metabolic function during pregnancy and the risk for neurodevelopmental outcomes. And so it's a case control study again, and it's a Kaiser Permanente birth cohort. The children were born in 2011 to 2015, so that's, that's our window. And one of the things we're looking at maternal characteristics, did they have a fever? Were they sick during pregnancy? We have all the medical records because this is Kaiser. We have the, we did a pregnancy survey. So we have a, a ton of questions on um, sort of what they, their exposures, their stress level. And we took samples. So instead of EMA, which was a one-time point, now we're taking it in the first and second trimester because we want to see how early we can pick up changes, but also are they sustained? You know, longitudinal studies always give us a better picture of reality than that sort of cross-sectional snapshot. And so we are looking at neurodevelopmental or several neurodevelopmental disorders. And as I said, the, um, the maternal genetic profile is, and the underpinnings of both of those are also being examined. So this is where enter COVID. And we were in this study and we realized, even though all the samples have been collected and we can't study the women that we were studying for that study, we could um, take the design for our study and address what we could learn about the effects of a maternal infection and neurodevelopment during the COVID-19 pandemic. So now we have several factors playing in here because not just infection, but also the stress of living in the uncertainty of the pandemic, everything that is going on right now, or that was cool. So what do we know? That maternal infection and fever increase susceptibility of offspring to several neurodevelopmental disorder, neurodevelopmental disorders, as I said, including schizophrenia and autism, that maternal inflammation during pregnancy can result from immune dysregulation due to infection or stress. Stress is also a very powerful um, immune dysregulator through the, the um, neuroendocrine system. And COVID-19 pandemic could result in increased maternal inflammation during pregnancy. So children born based on all the data that um, we have in, in just, you know, in terms of infection, that ch children born to women with lower socioeconomic status, Black or Hispanic race ethnicity, and women with pre-existing chronic health conditions known to exacerbate COVID-19 infections, such as obesity, diabetes, and asthma, will be at the highest risk. So this was our, our, um, our rationale as we, as we developed what we now have as part of our impact study, we wrote um, a proposal because NIH was asking, you know, for anything that, you know, we could be doing in this space during the pandemic, we wrote a, um, an, an administrative supplement that we got to establish a new pregnancy cohort to investigate the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on child neurodevelopment. And the hypothesis, as I said, is that maternal COVID infection and or pandemic related stress during pregnancy will increase the risk of ASD and other um, neurodevelopmental disorders in children via that in utero exposure and heightened in maternal inflammation during pregnancy via either stress or um, infection. So we have a prospective pregnancy cohort um, of the Kaiser Permanente pregnancies in 2020. There are 45,000 of those that we had access to. We have the electronic health record data collected for all mothers and children. And that's also the beauty of this study. We have an online survey during pregnancy. Our goal was to get about 20,000 of these answered. We got over 20,000 
without any problem at all. And I know it's higher than that now. So this is for self-reported infection, potential exposures, symptoms that they had, stress, depression, anxiety, the impact of COVID on employment, food security, behaviors, and healthcare, you know, their access to healthcare during this time. So for um, Kaiser, COVID-19 testing and the newborn blood samples, so they're testing for, using PCR testing is now done for all mothers at admission for delivery. So they have, we have a record of whether at the time of delivery they were, had active infection. But as I said, we also have the records and we have the questionnaire. So we're building a huge informational database. We're getting newborn blood spots. Unfortunately, the budget wasn't what we would like it to have been. And so we had, we could get about 550 um, of the newborn blood spots. And we're, we're skewing those toward women with active infection as best we can to get the most data out of that. Um, we're going to test for the cytokine chemokine profile to see if that's altered from those who did not um, have exposure. We're going to look for COVID-19 antibodies, both IgG, which would say at some point the mother was infected, and IgM, which would be an active infection. And the, child's, the child will begin making IgM. The IgG in, in, a, in a newborn is all maternal, and that is, is passively transferred from the mother. <clears throat> so... Among women with known COVID-19 infection during pregnancy, <clears throat> as I said, we'll examine the neonatal cytokine chemokine profiles in re relation to neurodevelopmental disorder that we will then wait till the children have, um, have reached the age of two to get a diagnosis. And we, our hypothesis is that it will, that COVID-19 infection during pregnancy will alter the immune phenotype of the newborn. So it will be it will that inflammation that the mother um, produced will be reflected in the newborn and that the, that the cytokine chemokine profile will, will predict the risk for that child then later on developing a neurodevelopmental disorder. So the relationship between the cytokine chemokine profile and, and DD risk will be modified by the timing during pregnancy of this infection, the maternal comorbid health conditions such as obesity, asthma, um, any autoimmune diseases the mother may have, and the child sex. We feel that, you know, because the, the propensity to males and in our animal studies that males are more susceptible to the maternal immune activation risk. So what are our findings thus far? So pretty much we're still waiting for all the births to happen and get all the newborn blood spots on my end. Um, so I haven't done anything in the lab yet. We're still accruing but um, those samples, but as anticipated, we're seeing frank disparities in rates of COVID-19 during pregnancy across demographic and clinical characteristics. So the highest in African-American, Latina, and, and Asian women in, in the catchment area down in um, the Bay Area, highest in women under 25 years of age. So the, the women who pr presumably thought that they couldn't be infected um, and not worrying about exposures at that time. And then highest in, in women living in neighborhoods with high deprivation, and as well as women with pre-existing asthma, allergies, or obesity. So we're actually seeing what we predicted we would see um, as ter in terms of the rates through the health records at Kaiser. Um, so in an analysis of the national surveillance data that included pregnancy status, so this is just the risk associated with having a COVID-19 infection when you're pregnant. Um, which I can't imagine in this time I, I, how utterly terrifying that must have been for people um, to deal with that, and and still is. I mean, it was, it's not gone. It's I mean, we've got it under control. California, we're in great shape, but not the, the rest of the uh, world is not necessarily where we are. Um, <clears throat> but in an analysis of the national surveillance data that included pregnancy, so this is from. Um, through October 2020, and we know based on that date that it got worse um, after October, uh, there were 409,000 women with symptomatic, not asymptomatic, but symptomatic COVID-19 illness. So the adjusted risk ratio in pregnant women versus those of similar age and not pregnant was three times greater, oh, sorry, three times greater for being admitted to the intensive care unit for intubation. Um, 2.9, so three times greater for mechanical ventilation being needed, and 1.7 times greater for death due to COVID. So, you so pregnant women are 
highly at risk for having a worse outcome. Not That's not even talking about what may happen in their children. This is just them. Um, so preventing critical COVID-19 infection is important for both the mother and the fetus. And this, these studies were being done in real time as things were coming out and as we're learning more about what to do. And then we got the vaccine developed. And I know many, many of us received, you know, just breathed a sigh of relief because that meant that the people, especially the elderly that were at such high risk could then um, be more protected. Um, unfortunately, I fall into the high risk category because of my age. And so, you know, and, and we, were, we were vaccinated very early here at the, um, in the health system at UC Davis. But pregnant women with severe or critical COVID-19 infection are, as I said, they're increased risk in their health, but they're also at increased risk for preterm birth and pregnancy loss itself, because you are now sort of overriding the immune system that controls your response to infection in studies and, and maintains a healthy pregnancy. So in studies of hospitalized women with COVID-19, which thus it's about 240 um, to 427 infected women, the risk for preterm delivery, both induced and spontaneous, ranged from 10 to 25%, but the highest rates were 60% among women that had critical COVID-19 illness. So the primary risk to a pregnancy appears to be from the maternal illness itself in, in trying to maintain a pregnancy. You can imagine your body's working very hard to stay alive and maintain a pregnancy at the same time. In addition, pregnant women may be at higher risk for severe illness and death, as I said, caused by COVID-19 compared to non-pregnant women. So what about vaccines during pregnancy? And I, this is probably, an, an, you know, that question came up in the chat. This is probably the single most question, the, the question that we get asked the most, right? And I, I'm going to talk through what we know. I, obviously, we're in the midst of dealing with it. So, you know, we're gathering data as fast as we can on this. But I want to say that the, the immunization, and as I said, we've all had it here, um, is, is an immunogenic but non-infectious. There's no way for you to spread infection from this vaccine. It's a non-integrating platform. What that means is it does not go into your DNA and stay there forever. And the mRNA vaccines have potential benefits over the live attenuated virus vaccines, um, but the, uh, or the inactivated or subunit vaccines. So some of those like the inactivated subunit vaccines like we use for influenza and the DNA-based vaccines. But the mRNA vaccines which was all new and everybody's like, oh my goodness, you know, it's, it, you know, it's integrating it. It's not, it's making one tiny little piece of the, of the virus. It's making that, that little um, spike protein that you are that, um, the thing you see, you know, the little spike gas that comes off. There's no risk of acquiring infection from the vaccine. There just is none. It, it just, it doesn't have all the machinery to even be able to produce a virus. There is no adjuvant. So there's no, because of the RNA, the way it is designed, there is no need for an adjuvant with this type of vaccine. And um, while no specific studies have evaluated the ability of the lipid nanoparticle that's encased in to protect the RNA so it can get in you to get made, RNA is super fragile. Our mRNA is very fragile. Exposure to anything is going to degrade it, and then it's not going to be any good. So they put it in this little lipid um, vesicle that helps helps it get be protective it also helps it get taken up so that it can do its job and then in, elicit the immune response so um so it's not going to really go very far because really quite honestly, they shoot it in your arm and it gets taken up locally and then that is that's why your arm hurts so much after this vaccine right everything is taking place right there and so that response the um so, you know, with the second vaccine, a lot of people say, oh my God, I just felt like I was run over by a truck because your immune system is now doing its job. What you're experiencing is the response, not, not your vaccine. It's your response to the vaccine, meaning you have responded as you should. When my son, who's uh, 21, said, oh my God, mom, I'm so sick. I feel so terrible. I said, good. That means you're making a response to the vaccine. You're good. You'll be good in 12 hours. You will feel fine. Uh, 24 at the most. So, um, the vaccine components have a minimal chance to risk of, of reaching the fetus. So, the, you know, the big question is, 
does does you know the CDC definitely did the best they could to come out with uh, you know their position on on vaccine vaccinating during pregnancy, um, and they've done trials now and have shown you know back when I did this originally this talk um, for the Mind Institute you know, during um, in August last year it was like it was we were in real time they were trying to figure it out now they've done the studies and they've shown it to be both effective and safe for the majority of people and um but clinicians should acknowledge with empathy right the limited available evidence that i mean we've we've done the studies now but it's still we haven't done you know hundreds of thousands of people at this point but also the tension that we have over the potential benefits of vaccination weighed against the potential risk whether they're real or or theoretical at this point. So one of their suggestions was that women at risk due to their occupation, frequent necessary contact with others or inability to sequester during their pregnancy for occupation or other reasons, uh, COVID-19 vaccination was recommended, right? If you could protect yourself from ever getting COVID and just be so careful, and then you, you, you don't have to get vaccinated. You are going to have, you're gonna want to at some point so you can um, have, you know, all of the benefits of having that protection, but, you know, that is a choice you can make. So in the end, you know, we know that maternal, and, and then I can, I will have some time to address the questions, um, that, that we know that maternal immune activation and inflammation during critical periods of gestation can increase the likelihood of having a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder. That's, that's our bottom line. We don't know how it works necessarily. We're working on that. We just got a big Conti Center grant to, to address that and to address why we see this difference in, in, in the ability to regulate a response during infection. This is not there. So this is not necessarily specific to the infect infectious agent, which is primarily the case with Zika. Zika virus has the ability to go in to the brain and the ability to cross in the placenta and get into the fetal compartment and unfortunately cause the effects that we see with Zika. Thank goodness it's as rare, it's rare, as rare as it is. But it's rather how the woman responds immunologically, and that's what we were really dealing with. So not all women that have an infection with fever will have a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder. I cannot say this enough. Um, but at this time, we do not yet, yet understand all the risk factors that determine this outcome. And so we work every day trying to understand this better. So with that, I'm going to just thank the, my lab is phenomenal, <coughs> excuse me, and without them, I, I couldn't do anything I do, and the same with my collaborators. I have an incredible group of people that I get to work with that fill in the gaps in my knowledge base. I'm not a neuroscientist. I, I'm not a brain person, but I thank goodness work with people who are very good at that part of their, of things, so I can uh, both learn from them and help, have them help me. So with that, I am going to move over to the Q&A part of this. So go ahead and continue to type. Um, and I we've got some in chat and we have some in um, that have been emailed and we have <laughs> some in, so I'm gonna go through what I can. So I'm gonna start with um, the, um, does the flu or any other vaccine, um, do they, does it affect pregnancy? So I'm going to tell you that if you get sick with the flu, it is going to be far, far worse than the minimal. I don't even respond to the flu vaccine personally. I don't. And, and they've taken thimerosal out of everything now. So, um, and you can ask for thimerosal, but you can make sure of that when you get any vaccination. But I will tell you, I don't even respond when I get a flu vac, not compared to what the COVID vaccine was like um, in terms of a local response. So, I mean, that's a blip right, in time. But if I got the flu and I've got a fever for a week, that is going to have a much more negative um, impact on the pregnancy in just in my personal estimation. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a personal choice always, but um, pregnant women absolutely can be vaccinated now. The, the CDC and the FDA have approved it for vaccination during pregnancy. Um, you could ask for the one shot, one, um, I, you know, I, I think the Pfizer of the two vaccines is probably the least um, 
people have seemed to have the least negative response to that in terms of, of having a fever. I got the Moderna one and I can tell you, I feel fully protected now. Um, and uh, let's see. And so that I, hopefully I answered that question about um, getting a vaccination. Is Mia related to, or linked to aggressive or autoimmune autism? So maternal immune activation is not really linked directly to a specific neurodevelopmental disorder at this point. I think the take home message is that, that and how we present our finding is it's a model for if you perturb the immune system, it changes the way the brain develops. There are people, you know, the early research on this was actually in schizophrenia, not autism. And we sort of adopted it into autism as a way of potentially looking at autism. So that's why it depends on the timing, the severity, the genetic makeup, familial history. So there are so many components to that. Um, in our Conti Center, we're looking at the way mice, just their basal immune response. You know, we, we're, we give them a very small dose of poly-IC, which is what we use as a mimic for, for a viral infection. And these are mice that are Inbred mice, they're supposed to be really genetically similar and they respond very differently, even in these genetically nearly identical mice. They're not congenic, but they're close to it. And so that tells you even in a mouse model, can you imagine in humans the difference, right? And so that is what, that's really what we're working on. Um, so I answered the vaccine question regarding inflammation. Can you address the discussion? around potential inflammation activation from the vaccine and its attachment to the vascular system. Appreciating risk benefit over time, sounds like you are concluding still more benefit to vaccine. Um, I'm going to tell you that I actually, unfortunately contracted COVID before we knew all of the symptoms of COVID in someone. I would not wish that on my worst enemy. I got it badly that when you're wondering if you can take a breath, a deep breath, it is not, I had a fever over 101 for 10 days. This is not something you want when you're pregnant. And so that's my, per, that's my personal opinion on that. Um, I think, um, you know, the J&J &J one shot, one and done vaccine potentially may cause some issues for people in a certain um, age range. But, um, you know, I think, this is when you talk long and hard with your healthcare professional. Um, the, um, so based on the cell danger response camp of thought, is mitochondrial support supplementation reasonable prior to immunizations? Though it is, is that unlikely to be harmful, but possibly supportive based on robust immunization response dependency on mitochondrial integrity. So, I mean, that is very correct. Dave is a longtime friend of mine and, and clinician, and it's a, it's a great question because the immune, system, the immune response drains your energy reserves, right? The immune response is highly um, energy intensive, and so your mitochondrial reserves are going to go down a little bit. So I think it's always a good idea to, if, you, if you're sick or, um, you know, during infection that my mitochondrial support is going to help the rest of you, your body deal with things, especially at uh, energy level. So what would recommendation be if you contract COVID-19 during pregnancy and recover, would the science still suggest the vaccine during pregnancy? I would say no. Since this happened to me, I was planning to wait until I delivered. I absolutely would wait on that. And the reason I say that, because I've been both vaccinated and had live infection, and I haven't told very many people that I got sick, but for the purposes of this, I wanted to give you my, you know, my personal perspective. You're protected from being sick, right? You're, you're, you have an immune response. I tested myself even before I got the vaccination, but the reason I got vaccinated is because my natural infection may not have covered me as well, especially to the variants that are coming out. However, if you got sick after, you know, already being infected, it would be, you would not be nearly as sick. So you would not have that incredibly robust um, response. So I would say I would wait. Uh, with maternal immune activation leading to neurodevelopmental disorders, is this priming the immune system for pandas in the child? That is a great question. And I think we really don't understand um, 
pandas. Pandas is related to um, response to infection and generating a pans panda, but however, pandas, it keeps changing. It's, you know, it's got new names, but it's related to your response to it's a molecular mimicry to um, a bacterial infection. Now, what um, happens during that infection, and it sort of pushes you past your regulatory to create these transient autoantibodies, which then can go away with, um, you know, or that, that sequelae can be dampened down by getting in, by getting rid of the infection um, in most cases. So um, what we do know from our maternal immune activation animal models is that maternal immune activation does um, imprint on the child's immune response later so that they may respond differently to the exposure that their mother had. So if they get an influenza, so we do this in our animals and they respond differently than, uh, and we did it in our um, monkey models that the, um, to their um, peers that got, did not get um, the maternal immune activation um, poly IC. So that said, I don't know how, but it does um, affect the um, long, there are long-term effects in the immune system of the um, offspring. So what things are being done to mitigate or help those identified with elevated cytokines and chemokines? I would say a non-inflammatory diet. So omega-3s, the best you can do to have a healthy non-inflammatory diet is the best we've got right now because we have to be careful what we give during pregnancy. But um, this is something that you should speak to your clinician about. But absolutely, if you can eat a, a low infl inflammation diet, it will definitely help. So isn't it true that a fever is a possible side effect of the MRA? Yes, it is not nearly as bad as the actual um, infection. What would, be, what would the immune reaction be in a mother and would this potentially impact the fetus? Is inflammation a part of the possible vaccine side effect? And, and are there any studies ongoing about potential impact on the immune system of the developing fetus? Yes, we have studies going on on all those things. We would like, we're working with NIH to try to set up a study about what happens when the mom is vaccinated to follow her during that vaccination and follow the outcome of the child in terms of just physiologically what is going on and immunologically. immunologically. I'm trying to go quickly so I don't, we don't run out of time because we've got two minutes. Um, but yes, fever is a possible side effect. Some people get one, some people don't. And it's not gonna be, it's gonna be so transient that it is certainly less impact than actually getting COVID. Um, and is inflammation, inflammation is always what you hope for when you get vaccinated because without it, you are not going to respond to the vaccine. So you must have inflammation to make an immune response. The difference between that type of inflammation and the sustained inflammation you either have with an illness or have with an autoimmune disorder is very different. It's very transient and it's, it's very directed by how we build vaccines to uh, stimulate a specific arm of the immune response. We had no results in our study for women that were affected by COVID and gave birth. That is what is ongoing. We're in real time here. So we have to wait till the children are at least two before we can identify who has a neurodevelopmental disorder. We are not two years into the study yet. So unfortunately it's gonna take us some time. Um, and nobody's got any data on that yet because children were just during, I mean, if, if, if they've got the, the history in real time, we're just now getting the moms um, the children born, but then none of them have been, um, are at the age where they can get a, an accurate diagnosis. Um, let's see, as I was a newbie in the ASD study, I have some questions about inflammation cytokines. Do you, do you think each cytokine has their specific effect on behavior? Um, we don't know that. Uh, unfortunately, cytokines don't act independently of each other, they're always in concert with another, one another. Um, oh, thank you, David. Answer with pans and embraces viral etiologies. That's good to know. <laughs> so um, David is like my source that I go to. Um, and UC Davis has great research, he said, on gut microbiome prior to vaccines for optimal immunogenetic support. So um, gut microbiome, is important, right? Having a healthy microbiome. I, I take a probiotic just for inflammation, right? Because I'm at that age where that's a scenario. And then I'm gonna flip over. Um, I'm happy to go as long as we wanna stay on 
Um, but um, questions from email, are children different? I know your work is focused on gestation. What is different when we look at the kids? Um, we do see differences in children, absolutely. So uh, Paul Ashwood and myself spend a lot of time looking at kids in terms of um, with autism and their immune systems. Um, in terms of um, some kids have a very inflammatory type profile, some have very downregulated immune systems to the point where they're sick a lot. And then there's others that are right in that middle range. So that's the beauty of working in autism, the heterogeneity, so you know, the differences that we see just within autism. Um, are huge. And so it makes it a little challenging, but we do see differences. And Paul has done some beautiful work on um, TGF beta. And it's um, the higher the levels, the lower um, the um, severity of, of autism. So even if a child has autism, there are differences in how um, their cytokine profiles relate back to their um, behavior. So you can look up um, Paul's work. Um, clarification with the vaccines, why are children different? Oh, no, that's a great question. I, yeah, so with the vaccines, children are different with the vaccines because their immune system is completely different than those of us who, as we've matured, a young child's immune system is designed to deal with infection after infection and be educated by those infections, right? We've seen a lot in our lifetime, so we've got a lot of um, memory cells floating around protecting us from the next insult from the same type of, of um, um, infectious agent. Children are just getting them, right? And oh, yeah, how sick do we get when our kids get sick when they're young? I mean, it's like it's constant. I felt like I was constantly dealing with something and my son would get over it very quickly and I'd be dealing with it for a week. Um, so yes, their immune systems are very robust and they're in the process of being educated to everything they're exposed to. Are there specific infections that are clearly associated with autism when the mother experiences them during pregnancy, like measles? Nope. That is one thing that has come out of our research. Now, that said, rubella, which is a measles virus, does cause its own um, outcome, right? We know that rubella has its own direct effect on, on development in, in many aspects, not just neurodevelopment. <clears throat> but what we really have found from all of the, um, with all of the um, sort of um, data out there from different exposures and all the epidemiology studies, it's really about, um, and some of those done at, at Kaiser, it's about the level of response to the agent. Do they get a fever? That's the first question. It doesn't matter what it is. Do they get a fever? How long does that fever last? How high is the response, right? The immune response to that. That's really what is driving the differences. Okay, let's see. I got the flu after having the flu vaccine, was not pregnant though. I'm 58. I had zero complications during pregnancy with my now 29 year old, no family history on either side. I was 28, husband 31, was not obese, received regular pre prenatal care vitamins, didn't drink, blah, 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 <laughs> et cetera. I did not have flu. I think son has ASD. Yes, unfortunately, we don't always know why. Um, you know, we can say a risk factor is not 100%. Everything we, that I quote to you about risk factors are what we see in a high enough uh, number of individuals to, to d look at it and discuss it. It is not, as I said, we don't, I, so much of, of um, etiology and autism is unknown, which is why I still have a job, right? Um, and so what we don't understand we're trying to learn. And, and I'm, I mean, we've come a long way since I've been doing this for um, the last 21 years. So um, that I think, you know, um, we do the best we can. And I wish I could just say, oh, yep, yeah, we know what this is, and this is this, and this is this, and we just don't. And so, as I said, we're doing the best we can. My goal today was to be informative, to understand the risk benefits, to understand the mechanisms as much as we do and that we're continuing to look at that. I mean, I just, as I said, we've got five years of funding now to really, really drill down into understanding this maternal mean activation response and the different outcomes that we see from that.